Yeah, international criminal investigations. You have to know more about that because that's happening because there's that, more international crime, crimes against humanity and the like. And so here we are on transitional justice. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. And we have our old friend, Nicholas Sussman Haran uh, from Bogota, Colombia, talking to us about um, some of the elements of how you do investigations of international crimes. Welcome to the show, Nicholas. Thank you, Jay. And it's always a pleasure to be here talking to you and our dear audience. Yes, absolutely. So uh, today really is a study of CSOs and how they, what they do, how they fit, what they mean, uh, their past, present, and future. What is a CSO? Right. So CSOs are organizations, either formal or informal, of people from communities that get together to do something, right? In the case of investigations, they care about the crimes or the human rights abuses going on in their communities, in their villages, in their towns, and they just decide to come together to address that issue, uh, either to support other organizations doing it or in many times in the absence of other actors that have to, to jump in and do the thing. So they decide to take matters in their own hands and try to make a difference. Mm. What, what does this stand for? Civil society organization. That's what they, what they stand for. Okay. And is it limited to uh, Bogota or Colombia or Latin America or is it everywhere? No, it's a global, it's a global issue. It's, I think it's just natural to human, well, to humanity, to humanity and to people caring about their issues. So they are worldwide and they just happen, right? Now we call them like that, but community coordination has been something in existence since forever, I would say. Mm -hmm. So uh, this sounds like a, a group, uh, a mission that, that would help a project expedite justice in its investigations. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, usually we work with them and it's essential for the success of an investigation to work with local organizations. Mm -hmm. So in order to do that, you have to approach them and you have to develop trust with them. Um, they have to know who you are, you have to know who they are. How do you do that? How do you approach them? Well, it's, I think that's the most challenging part of, of building that relationship, right? These are difficult contexts where crimes are occurring or occurred with communities that were deeply struck by violence and that can be full of distrust because of that, right? Because also there's a wide variety of actors with a lot of interests and it's hard to know who's who, right? Uh, and who's really trustworthy and who isn't. So there are different ways to do that. Sometimes someone that knows you uh, from before just introduces you to the organization. It can be donors, it can be other organizations that you have worked on, it could be some governmental organizations, and other times you're just cold calling people, trying to have a call to introduce yourself and to offer support. And I would say that's the best way of, of creating a trust-based relationship, right? First, acknowledging the importance of these organizations in their own context. They are the ones who know what's going on. And then just tell them that you're willing to support them, to provide something to increase their capacity to do things uh, and fill a gap that maybe other actors are not filling and that they need to fill. Well, can you give me uh, an example of the support you might provide? Yeah, absolutely. For example, knowledge of which crimes were committed, right? Terms as the ones you were mentioning, crimes against humanity, genocide, war crimes. These are terms that are very, um, they're impactful, right? And they uh, are lightly used many times by the media, by political actors to address different types of situations, right? And this creates some sort of expectations regarding justice, for example. Uh, and then when it comes to investigations, they don't mean this light uh, sense that is, is widely used, but they have, well, they are crimes like any other crime, right? They have some elements. And if you want to investigate them and pursue justice, you need to know what it entails, right? Uh, and many times uh, civil society organizations do not have this knowledge because of their uh, background, because they are just not legal organizations or something like that. So we bring that type of knowledge to help them understand what this means and what they can do with that situation they are facing on the ground. You use the word elements, and it takes me back to law school. <laughs> I want to remind everybody uh, that Nicholas is a lawyer. And uh, when he looks at crimes, he looks like every lawyer at the elements of the crime, A, B, C, D. And without that, you really can't get to first base. 
and people in the CSOs don't necessarily know about exactly. criminal law and elements of crimes, and so you have to tell them. <laughs> exactly. 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 So you meet with them and train them. Do you meet with them and tell them about these things? Do you do you visit them? Do they visit you? Is there a classroom involved here? Well, it depends. It depends, but uh, usually there's a uh, there's at least in PJ's Project Expert Justice way of operation a component of training always. Actually, we call it capacity building, right? So what you would like at the end is this uh, CSOs, the civil society organizations, to be able to conduct these activities by themselves, right? And to really stand as partners, as peers with you to do the thing. So you have to train them, of course, uh, to bring that knowledge to them. Uh, so yeah, usually we go there. Uh, it all depends on the security situations, or we have like different ways of doing it through remote uh, environments, through recorded materials through recorded materials with Q&A sessions. It all depends on the context. It all depends on the conditions on the ground, on the resources available. But we try to, to always be there and bring the knowledge to them instead of getting them out of their context. You want to bring always information into their reality. Why does the word vigilante come to mind? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a good question, and I think it's maybe the call for action that CSOs are doing. And is as I was mentioning, these are people who care about their reality and that when they see that something very serious and bad is happening and no one is paying enough attention or doing enough to address it, they take matters into their own hands and try to build something to, to fix the situation to see if they can get the authorities to, to act when there's no action. So, so of course, this is people trying to, to bring remedies to situations that are not being addressed perhaps by the ones who have to do it. I, you know, we have Netflix now in the time of COVID and, and we have Prime Video with Amazon in the time of COVID and uh, every second movie is, is about this kind of thing, about people taking matters into their own hands and seeking, um, seeking investigation, seeking truth. Because the government, the police, are not up to it. And is, is that what, what's happening here with the CC, CSO? Are they doing this because they don't feel the government and the police and the intelligence organizations are up to it? So I would say it's more complex than that, but it certainly has that element, right? Uh, yeah, many times it happens that the government is the one involved in committing the atrocity. So, of course, they're not interested. That's one possibility, and we see that frequently. Um, the other thing is that usually this happens in marginalized, impoverished communities with little state presence. So they take situations in their own hands, of course. And uh, in these places, this type of, of crimes occur frequently. They can even become part of the reality. So maybe they are not addressed in the proper way. Uh, maybe the government doesn't have the resources or doesn't care enough. But what is clear is that these communities do care enough because this is affecting their own realities, right? Their daily living, the people they met, they knew. It's, it's affecting not only the individuals, but the social fabric. So they take up the situation in their own hands because it matters to them. And they cannot stand still while this, while this occurs. And there's one point where the excuses of no resources, no interest uh, are not enough, right? So they decide to do something about it. This is so interesting because, you know, I suspect um, this is a growing movement, the CSO movement, that there are more crimes and there's more, um, you know, police uh, in, in uh, uh, inactivity. Um, and so this is, this fills the vacuum and it, it's not only in Latin America, as you say, it's all over the world, but I, I can't think of a, of a place where it would not be appropriate, um, given what is happening, what we see happening, to police organizations that are misguided or, or inactive. Um, and, and so, uh, to me, this is, a, may I say, it seems like it's part of an, our new society. It's not just what Project Expedite Justice sees and touches. Um, it's much broader than that because the problem is broader than that. Am I right? What are your feelings? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I feel an increase in the importance of, of civil society. So civil society has always been important and most significant changes in history have been 
achieved from popular social movements pushing politics in a certain direction, right? That then and then the fight is picked up by a politician, a leader, something like that, and then changes happen, right? Uh, but now we're seeing a boom of the role of civil society and individuals. I would say that, and with the existence of tools such as social media, the wide availability of training materials online, and the possibility of taking a phone and becoming an activist, uh, an investigator, a journalist, there is an increase in the importance of civil society and also in the impact they can have on reality. So, and, and, and also in addition with a sense of frustration of changes taking too long, not happening, being too complicated. Uh, I think it's a, it's a combination of, of the feelings of people wanting and pushing for change and the resources available to actually make an impact that before perhaps was more challenging. God, we don't have enough time to cover this. We probably have to come back, I swear. There's so much here. You know, now, another group of movies that you see on Netflix and Prime are the, are the movies of the police themselves who, who go renegade, who decide that they're going to be their own judge and jury and go out and, and punish people. And I, I don't think that's completely fabricated. I think that does happen. And so the, the question, and this is the dark side of it, is, is whether the CSOs do that too. Um, whether it be an old, an old crime or a crime, as you say, that's happening in real time, um, perhaps uh, they're motivated, their same motivations that make them want to join the CSO in the first place um, to you know, take a look at the information they've gathered and go out and, and be a judge or jury and, and, and an executioner, so to speak, um, to people who they find in their capacity as members of the CSO um, who, have, who have done wrong. Does that happen? Well, not, not on the side of CSOs. I think there, when you draw the line between CSOs and other type of groups who take justice in their own hands, like, I don't know, self-defense group, vigilantes, even rebel groups, I don't know. No, civil society organizations usually work within institutionality and try to supplement their effort, right? So for example, if a case is not being investigated, civil society organizations can go around with the proper training and collect the evidence, interview people, collect witness testimonies, and like prepare a file, right? And then go to the prosecutor and say, okay, here's the investigation, please move forward with this case and then support that work with advocacy, with demonstrations, with media campaigns to trigger action, right? So they not, are not only on the advocacy side waiting for things to happen through media pressure, perhaps, if we can call them, but they're also doing things that other actors could and perhaps should be doing, uh, but they actually advance, so there's no excuse about, I don't know, the lack of resources, the lack of staff uh, to do things, right? They advance as much as they can to try to get a result. Okay, well, let's have a, a fact pattern, a hypothetical, okay? <laughs> so... So I'm in one of the CSOs and I find that there's been a crime committed um, and it's really a um, notorious crime. It's been in the papers, for example, but the police aren't doing anything. So I go out and I investigate. And I investigate with the benefit of what uh, Project Expedite Justice has taught me. You've taught me about evidence and the admissibility of evidence and how you, uh, you know, obtain witnesses and talk to them and document what they say and all that. And I make a file and I put all this in a file and I deliver it to um, a, a, police, a, a police organization that should have been investigating it in the first place, but failed to do so. And I say, look, we did this. This is all kosher. Um, you know, we did this in accordance with the rules of evidence and the rules, you know, the, the proper rules of investigation and so forth. And we're handing you the file. We want you to take it further, prosecute it, turn it over to the prosecutor, turn it over to the judge, whatever. Um, and nothing happens. Nothing happens because it's corruption. I'm in my fact pattern. There's a little corruption there and they're not going to do anything. Um, now you said that they would go into demonstrate, they would try to embarrass the authority. How do they do that so it works? And does it always work? Well, so it not, doesn't always work because you can only get some so far with this. And in, in your fact pattern, there's like a deep and rooted corruption they're basically immune to this type of, of, of media pressure, right? That's that's a reality, but you try to do your best. 
uh, but it can be successful in different ways. And that's also part of the strategy, right? Uh, with, with the media pressure. And many times it works. Many times it works. And they, there are organizations that, uh, of the CSOs that not only know the legal part, but the media part. And they're very effective doing Facebook campaigns, sign up letters, conducting interviews, showing videos around, uh, even rallying resources to, to this. So, so that works many times. The other alternative is that you also have to be strategic about where you want to take it, right? So many times the uh, local judge is not the authority you should take it to. So maybe you have to go a level up or you can submit it to other organizations that have like a, a more strength, like I don't know, the UN or international organizations or human rights bodies. It, it all depends on the case. It depends on the violation. But that is also part of the strategy you have to think about. Not only what do you collect, but where do you want to take it? Because if it's futile to file it before a local prosecutor, you're not going to give your evidence away that easy to a corrupt officer, right? right. So that's part of, the, of the knowledge that, that CSOs uh, also get uh, from us and that also give to us, right? Because they tell us, no, you, you might think that your local prosecutor is the good one, but actually it isn't. Let's explore other options, right? This is so interesting. So you have to know um, who the good judges are and who the bad ones are. And yes. likewise, you have to know who, the, who the, the, the truthful media is and who it isn't. There's not all, I mean, I would imagine, look around the world, not every media is independent and free speech. Some are not. And that, that this effort you're describing, the CSO arrangement you're describing, requires at least some honest prosecutors and judges and requires at least some honest media, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I go back to the biggest asset they give you and is that they know who's who in their, in, 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 in their, in their town, in their country and so on, right? So we work internationally at Project Expedite Justice. And as much as I I'm a disciplined professional and I read and I try to get familiar with the context. There are things that you cannot know unless you're living on the ground, knowing who's who, right? In the same way you and I know in our neighborhoods, in our cities, which are the good places to eat, which are the places to avoid, they also know it and in, and in public administration as well. So they are the ones who are gonna tell you, no, this thing that you thought was a good one is not, let's avoid this, let's do that. Uh, that if we went and do it by, your, by ourselves as Project Expedite Justice, we would probably make lots of mistakes uh, because we perhaps naively think that the local judge is a, is, a, is a good one, that we should go for the domestic avenue first. And then, you know, that they, 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 they tell you, no, this is compromise. Don't do that. Uh, let's try to do another way. So, so I would say there's no way of doing a good case without local organizations because you just don't know where you're standing. Is there danger? Is there danger to somebody in CSO in a CSO who is investigating, let's say, a sensitive case involving people who have the ability to um, to attack? Yeah, absolutely, 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 and. Uh, Many times when you hear about human rights defenders being killed, being targeted around the world, well, there's people investigating human rights violations, investigating international crimes, investigating corruption in their communities. They're also human rights defenders in, in the broad sense. So when we're speaking about, uh, and, and you listen about violations against human rights defenders, these people are included and they're the most at danger because they are the ones picking a fight directly with very powerful and dangerous people committing these crimes with a usually financial or economic interest behind and that control a lot of institutions and even security forces in, in their place. So it's a dangerous job. And that is part of the cautions that you have to take. You have to try to do it in, the, in a safe way, uh, but they're exposed to threats all the time. Mm. Well, we have plenty of threats in this country all the time, I think right now, if you follow the newspapers. So what we you know? What are you? What, what do you tell them? Keep it secret. Do not reveal your identity. Um, you have to be an investigator w without um, letting people know. So I think the first thing is every investigation has to prioritize security. That's mm -hmm. the first thing. Uh, justice is important, but just being another figure in the numbers of 
killed human rights defenders, of arbitrarily detained human rights defenders, is not going to do any better to to improve the situation. So that's that's the first thing, and that's part of the challenges many times of of working in the situations, right? Because these are people that come from the communities that care deeply about the situation. Many times you are willing to take risks that you would not take if you were an outsider, right? Um, so it's very important to to work with them and tell them, okay, I need you safe. I need you alive. First, because you're valuable as a person, you're valuable to this community. And second, because you're valuable to the case. You're no good to the case if you're dead. Uh, and, and also uh, a very open and high profile also endangers the witnesses and so on. So this type of investigations have to be done safely, taking precautions, hearing about security, uh, and, and so on. It's not just about the outcome, but about the way in which you do it to guarantee that you are not creating more risk and more harm that has already been inflicted, right? What about the public in general, especially the ones who are on social media, who are following the action? Well, it's it's part of the it's part of the work and also depends on the on the um, on the organization, right? Because it's it's always a balance between how visible do you want to be or not to achieve your purposes, right? So we've been saying that security is a concern. So you want to keep a low profile to, to be secure, but also if you have a very, very low profile, no one knows who you are, then if something happens to you, no one will notice, right? That's that's one thing that could happen. On the other side, also having a high profile uh, makes you harder to target because the government or the rebel groups or whoever is, is, is committing those crimes are gonna pay some consequences if something happens to you. So that's that's one thing. And social media becomes interested, interesting also as a tool of protection in this way. And the second uh, thing is that also um, people care about this as well. So if there's a campaign about something, if there's a sign up letter, people start caring about it. It brings importance to the issue. It goes beyond the CSO into the public. So occasionally they do. Uh, get this, and they can even get financial support because they do fundraising and crowdfunding and all that for for different types of things. So those are also elements that happen in, in the situations. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot of CSOs worldwide. The media work is very hard, and it requires a lot of effort, like to keep to keep it fed it to. So you always have to be creating content and and so on. So it takes a toll. But the ones who are good at it get a lot of of positive resources from that, including visibility, security, financial resources, and, and so on. And it's it's part of the work nowadays. Are there forces that are organized to try to confuse and distract uh, the conversation of the, uh, the CSOs? In other words, uh, well, we have that in this country, obviously, and Vladimir Putin is an expert at it in Europe and this country. Um, people who try to distract and confuse the message who try to um, divide the group, so to speak, so that it's not functional. Uh, is there any organized uh, organized force that tries to do this in the in the CSOs you're aware of? So, not a, like uh, an organization that you can pinpoint, but you can pinpoint governments that do not like them at all and that target them as such, and that as I, I was mentioning, that associate them to illegality, rebel groups, uh, spread fake, fake news and so on. And you have, uh, that that's a sign of an authoritarian government. When they start picking a fight with civil society organizations, with human rights organizations and twisting the message of what they're doing and starting to, to link them to illegal activities, that's something that should be suspicious. So that's, that's one thing. And then on the other side, you have illegal groups, criminal groups that do not like the work they're doing and they also target them. Uh, to do that. And, and the third possibility is that CSOs are very flexible, right? Uh, most of them are uh, solidly based, uh, good organizations trying to do a good job for their communities, but there can be civil societies created for any purpose, right? Uh, even, even controlled by governments and so on to, to push some interests. And that also happens. And it's the dark side of CSOs that because they're so flexible, and they're community-based. Well, a community can believe whatever it wants to believe, right? And uh, I think that is something we're also seeing in politics, something that we're also seeing in 
in in in in criminal investigations and so on that they they got they use the figure of the CSO to get the prestige of the transparent human rights caring organization to spread messages or actually do criminal activities uh, and that is something that that well that is a reality and and also takes a hit on the rest of the CSOs right well how how can you tell which one who the good guys are uh, how can how can the community tell? Well, it's it's hard because there are a lot, as I tell you. So if, if if you and I come together today and decide that we want to create a CSO caring about whatever, we can do it. Uh, so I think you have to start. If you care about something, you have to do your research, go on the internet, see what they have done, who they have worked with, if they have results, what's their history. Uh, and and so on. Just be diligent about knowing who they are. Uh, of course, it's a lot. It's a lot to track, and it's you cannot keep an eye for on on all of them, right? But if you care about one, if one picks your interest, uh, it's just go online and try to do a bit of research to see who they are and 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 so on, and see if they're worth worth supporting. And if not, there are a lot uh, of other organizations doing the similar work. Uh, that are, that are good and serious, but it's it's very hard because they're flexible and they can happen anywhere, right? So mm -hmm. it's not like you have a, a, a 10 to, to 50 organizations list. There are thousands of them around the world doing a lot of things and being used for a lot of purposes, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a challenge. Well, if I ask you, I come in off the street one day and I ask you, Nicholas, uh, can you help me find the good ones? And can you help me ignore the bad ones? Can you help me with that? Well, I would, I would, I have my, 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 the ones I care about, but the first thing is start with the issue you care about, right? Not start with the organization, find an issue you care about and then start looking for that one. And, and, and that's an easier way to find them. Uh, and the track of effort and, and good work and results, I think is the best way to find it because otherwise it, it's untraceable. You cannot start with the organization as such unless you find one specific one and you research that one. But just scouting for CSOs is, is a challenging, it's a challenging job. Maybe start with a problem you care about and then find who's working on it. It's a better way to, to, uh, to approach the issue. Yeah, I think, I think um, you know, this is really uh, parallel to the, the whole social media thing in this country. And uh, probably the lessons you're talking about for CSOs globally apply to um, social media in this country just as well. You know, a few weeks ago, we had um, we had a remarkable show also here on uh, transitional justice um, with a, a fellow in, in Ukraine, live in Ukraine. Um, Koval was his name. And uh, I don't know if you've met him or compared notes with him, but um, he was talking about how if you're chasing war criminals, you have to keep a database. Um, you have to make a list, and you have to be able to find them, and know their names, and know their, uh, you know, their 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 fake names and all that. Um, you have to see what they're involved. You have to have to be able to check their communications with other such members of, 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 of criminal of war crimes groups. Um, and I wonder. Uh, this is really uh, it occurs to me after talking with you. Um, if the um, CSOs um, um, compare notes, uh, whether they make lists like that, figure out who's who, and and whether one of them will share that information with another, um, I mean, safely, safely, so it doesn't get fall into the wrong hands, so to speak. Um, but it's, it's been useful in in Ukraine for the Ukraine government and uh, for you know the people who are trying to find work or criminals there and actually prosecute them, uh, you got to find them first. So <clears throat> what about CSOs? I mean, do they have that kind of technology? Um, do they have, um, you know, information technology that would help them uh, make lists and then find people and then share lists? Right. So you could have them in two ways. The, 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 those lists exist. The first one is if they achieve certain degree of organization, of institutionality, they can become registered as charities, nonprofits, NGOs, and so on. So that's one way of checking if they are if they are there. 
just look at the registries. The other thing is that they usually work in coalitions and that as it, this is trust-based. They know each other, right? So they can point you in the right direction of who's who. Uh, so there are lists based on these coalitions, right? So I don't know, the organization, there's a coalition of uh, organizations that work on indigenous people's rights. And then you see who are the members and you see, okay, this 20 organizations are the ones, I know one that is trustworthy uh, because I've known them for whatever reason. I like them. I saw them in the movie. I saw a documentary, something like that. And I see they work with these other 19 organizations. So that's a way of knowing and navigating who, who are the good ones, right? Um, beyond the formal aspect, because that's, that is something that should be considered from these organizations. They're very informal and it's good that they are because they overcome formal barriers from, from bureaucracy and so on. But a way to know which ones are good is maybe referring to these networks um, where you probably know one of the organizations or the donors supporting them or something like that. So, so that way you can see that they are serious and they mean business, right? Yeah, oh, very important. Well, you know, I, I asked you before whether uh, the whole notion of SEOs is, is a growing phenomenon in the world. And, and we know that it is, but the question is how successful is it? How successful is it for you, for the investigations that, you know, you conduct or, um, you know, supervise or, or consult about with uh, the CSOs and, um, and how successful will it be in the future? And what has to happen globally to make it more successful as a, a counterbalance, if you will, to autocracy? Right. So they're very successful, I would say. Actually, I think they're an element necessary for success, right? Because of the ground knowledge they have that I wouldn't, right? I cannot arrive to any country in Africa, show my face around and start asking questions, asking for evidence, picking up stuff from the ground. I cannot do that. I don't know it. No one's going to trust me. It's going to be suspicious. And I don't know the place, right? So, so that's, that's the first thing. The other thing is that they have access to places that we don't. We don't, and they have real-time access. So an attack occurs, some violation is happening, they are already there. So if they have knowledge, they can deploy right away and do the thing in a responsible way if they have, if they have the, the proper training. That, that, that is the objective, right? Uh, and also they know, they know better what's going on. So, so in that sense, they are very successful. And they actually help you overcome challenges that big organizations, big NGOs, international NGOs cannot surpass on their own because there are some obstacles that does it doesn't matter how big or uh, respected you are, you cannot surpass, right? You cannot go into a conflict zone if you're going to raise attention, yeah? If you're going to bring attention to yourself. Well, if you're a local, you can go around uh, in a better way, for example. So that's that's a thing. What's the challenge for them? Coordination, as I told you, there are many, and there are many working on the same thing, so they can overlap, uh, and resources. These are processes that require high level of sophistication, of training, of uh, logistics to, to be able to collect some forms of evidence, uh, going from witness testimonies that you need to have a place to sit down in a safe way, to listen to someone, to offer refreshments, to take the time to do it, uh, to the collection of physical evidence that require a whole lot of technical expertise so you're not going to contaminate and know the shell of a bullet with your fingerprints or something like that, you know? Uh, so resources are, are a challenge. And as these are small local organizations, there's a funding uh, challenge for them, right? They need to get the resources. And as there are so many and the funding is so limited, that jeopardizes the level of, of success. And, and the third element is, is knowledge is knowledge. You can have the best intentions, but if you're not properly trained, you don't have, don't have the proper knowledge, you're not going to be able to, to serve the mission you want to serve in the proper way. And actually, you can be harming your own mission and the other people's mission that are working on the same thing because you can be affecting witnesses, blowing their covers, things like that. So that's that's the challenge for, for success of these organizations. You know, it strikes me, you said uh, at the outset that um, these uh, CSOs can do all kinds of things. I mean, it's not limited to criminal investigation or even criminal investigation of a certain kind of crime. 
It could be all kinds of um, social community, um, you know, uh, efforts to make things better. Well, do they ever get into politics? Do they ever run a candidate, for example? Do they ever try to influence the outcome of an election? They do. They do, actually. They do uh, because they want to push change and they have community coordination, right? And, and there comes a point where besides politics, they think they need to make a difference and they do not need the intermediary. And, and it, it happens. Actually, Colombia is a very good example at the moment. Our vice president used to be a social leader from a CSO, right? She uh, comes from a very uh, marginalized part of the country, uh, from a very humble social extraction, and she became a social leader and an environmental leader for many, many years. Uh, through community coordination and her group coordination, she even uh, fought uh, mining corporations, paramilitary groups to prevent them from accessing some resources in their communities, and so on. And at some point, she decided, okay, I've done, I've had impact at the local level in the immediate actions I can take, but I think now we need to take our ideas to the next level to make like structural change, you know? Uh, and she ran for president. She was a primary candidate and she got the second uh, place in the primary elections of her party. Uh, well, of the party that, so she was not part of a party of a coalition of parties and her movement was one of those parties in the group. Uh, and she gained so uh, much attention and so much prestige that the president who, well, the current president who maybe would have chosen another uh, vice presidential candidate uh, more aligned with political considerations decided to go for her because the social pressure was so high and she got so many votes uh, that he had to, to, to choose her. Otherwise, it would, he would have lost the election because he would have lost, lost the votes that she brought in. So, so at some point they take political, they take political action uh, because they want to and they're political actors or because they think it's the way of achieving their, their social agendas. Yeah, well, that would depend on the country. <clears throat> if the country is too far over, it may not be possible. Um, but yeah, one thing exactly. is, go ahead. No, exactly. And, and, and that was the case in, in Colombia, you know, before, I don't know, the peace agreement and the, uh, Many other things that happened with politics in the recent years, this, this wouldn't have, would not have been a possibility, right? And now it is. Yeah. And now it is. Well, as I was saying before, it sounds like the beginning of a, a new model, or at least the expansion of the beginning of a new model. And it may be worldwide, and it may be something that will emerge, can emerge to deal with autocracy. Uh, and that's very encouraging. Um, and so it, it may be a kind of, may I use this term, see if you think this term is adequate, a new democracy, a new element in finding democracy. It's not the same as the old democracy, it's a new democracy. What do you think, Nicholas? Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. I agree. And I think worldwide there's a frustration, general frustration, with the people who have held power traditionally, right? regardless of their views, regardless of their outcomes, there's exhaustion from people feeling unrepresented by traditional parties, by traditional politicians. So CSOs and civil society as a whole, I think is a way to, to challenge these traditional power structures and, and take over them even. Uh, we saw it here in this election in Colombia, uh, but I think it's something that is happening worldwide. Uh, every time the communities are organizing themselves and noticing that they don't need the politicians to, to push for change. So if I'm an ordinary person, say I just graduated from school, and I wake up one morning and I decide I want to watch Transitional Justice on Think Tech Hawaii, and I like, I like the notion of a CSO, and I want to join the CSO, become associated, how do I do that? Well, you can... You can go online, again, look for a problem you care about, right? Uh, I think mission and, and uh, having your mission clear is, is essential for the work of CSOs and for people who care about CSOs. So know what you want to work on and look if there's something locally working on that issue, right? And if it is, just reach out. 
If it's not, maybe it's your call to do it. So just bring a couple of friends together, start talking to people, start doing things. And once you notice, maybe you have some sort of coordination and then you will have a conversation about how formal and structured you want to make it, you know? Uh, but but the first thing is, I think that the, the nice thing and the admirable thing of CSOs is that this is people caring about people that come together to do something about the reality that they want to change. And in that way, it's a very uh, simple, but also fruitful way of addressing social issues without uh, all the complications that come from organizational issues, government issues, bureaucracy, and so on. That's something you will face longer uh, later down the road if things go, go right. Yeah, the general idea would be, if you want to seek change, then become at least to some extent an activist. A activism will hopefully save the world. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> well, thank you, Nicholas. It's been a great discussion. Really opened my eyes. I really appreciate you coming on, and I want to do this again. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> of course, Jake. Always a pleasure. <laughs> Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.